Patrick Barron is our returning guest this weekend for the first of a two-part interview. His last appearance discussing currency wars and the potential endgame for the euro generated huge interest at Mises.org, YouTube, Stitcher, and iTunes. Patrick is a professor at the University of Iowa and the University of Wisconsin, but more importantly for us, he's one of the foremost Austrian economists when it comes to the intersection of geopolitics, central banks, and Austrian theory. Our topic, both this weekend and next, is monetary imperialism, an issue with enormous implications for the world economy. How does the U.S. use the dollar as a weapon of economic and cultural power? How did the Bretton Woods Agreement set the stage for the U.S. dollar to dominate the world economy? And how long can it all last? What might the unprecedented collapse of a worldwide reserve currency look like? And how did the BRIC nations and the Asian central banks fight back? Patrick speaks to all of this and more, both this weekend and next. Stay tuned. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. I'm your host, Jeff Dice, and as promised, we are back for round two with our friend Patrick Barron. And the topic this weekend is monetary imperialism. Patrick, I'd like to start out by throwing out a quote from the former French president, uh, Giscard d'Estaing. I'm hoping I'm saying that closely to correct pronunciation. He said this in the 1960s. He termed the U.S. dollar status as the world's reserve currency as our exorbitant privilege. And from my reading of it, he didn't say this happily. He said it somewhat bitterly. So I'd like to get your thoughts in an overall sense of what the U.S. dollar status as the world's reserve currency really means. Well, um, actually, that uh, quote from this thing, I I thought that uh, I think probably Jacques Roof, who was the, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right uh, properly either, but he was the great uh, French economist who uh, was of the Austrian school. And uh, he is, I think he's the one who, who termed the, uh, the Bretton Woods Agreement as conferring upon the dollar and an and American exorbitant privilege. Now, Henry Hazlitt, um, who is a well-known American Austrian economist who at the time attended the Bretton Woods Agreement or Bretton Woods Conference in New Hampshire in 1944 as a, a reporter for the New York Times was very critical of the agreement because he said it, it conferred upon one nation too much of a too much power and it was too great a responsibility and I think what he meant by that was it conferred too great a a uh, a chance, an opportunity to cheat. <laughs> and this is exactly what America did. So what the Bretton Woods did uh, at, during World War II, because the U.S. had been the arsenal of democracy uh, before we actually got into the war, uh, two years after Britain did, um, we had uh, been producing arms for the, all the, uh, the allies. And we were, we had a huge balance of payments um, credit that was being paid in gold. And uh, over the course of the uh, war, the United States accumulated a huge reserve of gold. So we had, I don't know what the percentage was, but the lion's share of the world's reserve of gold in all the central banks. So at the Bretton Woods Conference, there was a desire to return to a, a to sound money of some kind. So what they came up with was that... Uh, there would be interbank settlement among central banks, and the settlement mechanism would be in gold or dollars, and that the dollar would be pegged at $35 an ounce. So if the Bank of England or the Bank of, well, let's just say the Bank of France, since we're talking about the French, so say the Bank of France accumulated um, a lot of dollars because uh, we were buying French goods, then the Bank of France periodically would present these dollars to the Federal Reserve Bank and would demand um, gold at $35 an ounce. Well, the central banks of the world uh, didn't really, this is called the gold exchange standard, by the way, and a private individual couldn't present, couldn't present the, the dollars to the Fed, but other central banks could. Um, so it conferred upon you know the U.S. the ability to, uh, if the dollars weren't presented for payment, to cheat and actually start printing money, which we did. But periodically, the banks would, would present some dollars. 
over the years, as the years went by, in, especially into the 60s, it was Charles de Gaulle who, along with Jacques, with the advice of Jacques Ruff, and Charles de Gaulle was a hard money man. He was a gold standard man. Um, uh, they recognized what the U.S. was doing, and they said, you know, there's some cheating going on here. Uh, the U.S. is printing dollars and buying foreign goods, so in effect, we're getting pieces of paper that are not really worth $35 uh, and for one thirty-fifth an ounce of gold, and yet we're giving the Americans good French goods for that. So he told the Bank of France to redeem eighty uh, percent of our do- of their dollar holdings, which they had counted as the same as gold at thirty-five dollars an ounce. Well, this over time started what, in effect, became a run on the Fed, and that is what drove us off, drove us off the gold standard in nineteen seventy-one. I did some calculations. Um, just recently to see, well, what would we have had to devalue the dollar to gold? What would have been the rate if we had, if Nixon, instead of just taking us off the gold standard, had decided to just uh, say, well, you're going to have to present more dollars to get your ounce of gold so that we don't run out of gold. And I calculated at that time it would have been over $400 an ounce, which shows how much money the U.S. actually printed in the, you know, since World War II. And of course, the, what really caused the big uh, explosion in dollar printing was um, Lyndon Johnson's uh, guns and butter policy of the 1960s, where he uh, simultaneously fought the uh, the Vietnam War and introduced uh, all his welfare programs that he called the Great Society. So the U.S. Has, at, was called a reserve currency. This is a sort of a technical term until we went off the gold standard. And so this technical term of reserve currency meant that you, a central bank would hold dollars as reserve the same as gold at a certain exchange ratio. So there, it was a technical term. Now, when the U.S. went off the gold standard, it didn't mean that people would, central banks would no longer hold dollars. It just meant that they're technically the term, calling it a reserve currency is just sort of an anachronistic name. And now uh, central banks hold dollars just for the convenience of it. And sometimes they hold dollars, often they're holding dollars for the wrong reasons because they have bad monetary policy themselves, which we can get into. So, uh, Jeff, that's kind of a long-winded explanation of uh, what it means to be a reserve currency. Well, Patrick, today Hans Hoppe, among others, uses the term monetary imperialism Mm -hmm. to describe U.S. monetary policy. And what he means by that, paraphrasing, is that the dominating state uses its position to enforce a policy of internationally coordinated inflation, in effect. So can you discuss this phenomenon a little bit for us? Well, what's happening today is um, all the central banks of the world are following the wrong uh, monetary policy, uh, which allows the United States uh, to become a monetary imperialist, which means that we are papering the world with our dollars and we're buying foreign goods and we're giving people uh, you know, paper dollars that are worth less and less all the time. Um, but we have to realize that there's, this is an imperialism that is, uh, only takes place because the other countries have bad monetary policies themselves. They, they allow it to happen. And here, so here's, a, here's an example. Uh, China runs a huge um, foreign exchange credit with the United States. And the reason they do that is because they're running a mercantilist economy, meaning that they believe that accumulating foreign reserves are good for their economy. Plus, they want to, they think that they can export their way to prosperity. So they are giving more yuan for the dollar than would be the case in a a non-interventionist market. If they did not inflate the yuan, then the U.S., importers who are trying to import Chinese goods would not get as many yuan for the dollar as they are now. Um, and therefore, China wouldn't sell as much to us, of course, because their prices would be technically higher in dollar terms. If instead of getting 10 yuan to the dollar, you only get eight or seven or six or five, then it technically means that Chinese goods are more expensive, but the Chinese don't want that to happen. They want to keep their export industries going, so they are in effect uh, they're printing more more yuan and they're importing inflation. But they import inflation, you might say, voluntarily. So 
but so they're allowing the United States to be a monetary imperialist and export export our inflation to them because they are rigging their own internal uh, foreign exchange markets. If they didn't do that, then the United States would be quickly called to account and we would see that our economy would go into recession because our foreign goods in the United States would become more expensive. Now, we can become a monetary, we can stay a monetary imperialist. The important point of this is only as long as the other countries allow that to happen. Um, and right now, we are seeing a lot of pushback in the world from Russia, China, um, the Arab countries, India, who are saying that, uh, you know, we, we don't want to trade in dollars anymore. We don't want to settle our accounts in dollars because the dollar is becoming is worth less and less. The U.S. is expanding it. So they're searching for some uh, some way to do this, something that is more honest. So they've talked about actually using gold as, as an exchange. And I think that this is going to continue because the U.S. is just, it, we show no inclination to stop our monetary imperialism because uh, there doesn't seem to be any reason to do it right now because everybody's accepting the dollar. But um, it's not going to last. Uh, what, what, what happens with all these imperialism of any kind, whether it's monetary or military, um, imperialism, it, it tends to expand and expand until it actually collapses. And at some point, you know, the, the rest of the world will realize that, uh, in effect, the emperor has no clothes and they're going to say, well, that's it. We're not, maybe it'll be Japan or maybe it'll be China and Russia and India that will get together. Maybe Brazil will jump in there too. And say, you know, we're just, we're not going to do this anymore. We're not going to use dollars to, uh, to settle our foreign accounts. We're going to use some other currency. And, um, uh, if I could continue this thought, my, my hope is that, um, one of the Western countries would be the one that would break this chain. And I was hoping, I am still hoping that it would be Germany rather than uh, Russia or China or, or, uh, one of the Arab countries. Um, because I, I just, think that Germany is a solidly Western, law-abiding, um, uh, has respect for property rights, uh, and it would, re- it would reinstate the Deutschmark, and um, over time, the Germans would not inflate, inflate the Deutschmark as the rest of the world uh, are inflating their currencies, and that the world would start uh, demanding more Deutschmarks, and that the, that would put pressure on America to stop inflating the dollar. Uh, so this is what I'm hoping would happen, and that this is how America's imperialism, monetary imperialism, would end. Let's face it, it will end because it's bad for the rest of the world. The rest of the world realizes that getting off of the dollar is not going to be painless, so they haven't been willing yet to endure the pain but the longer they put up with America's monetary imperialism, the harder it's going to be when they finally do throw in the towel and say, well, we've just got to do something else. So um, it will end, and I just hope it ends sooner rather than later. Well, that's interesting. You talk about pushback by countries, and there's a lot of angles to this. For instance, Asian central banks hold lots and lots of dollars, so they have a vested interest also as exporters in propping the dollar up, but they understand in a long-term geopolitical sense that having the U.S. dollar dominate is not in their interest. We've heard recently about this talk among the BRIC nations of potentially forming their own central banks. Uh, Patrick, would this be as simple as just uh, opening more oil exchanges that aren't priced in dollars? I mean, could that be the beginning of the, the fall of the House of Cards? Well, I think I think it's already beginning. And I, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's going to be simple, but I would I don't believe that we're going to see that there's any kind of great, uh, maybe, you know, sort of a Bretton Woods type conference among the Russians and the Chinese and maybe the Indians and the Arabs. Um, it's more likely that international corporations will start wanting to trade in something other than the dollar. And this is already happening. I have it on good, on good authority from, um, some friends who work for a, a major, major American export company. On the East Coast, that uh, therefore their their goods are being uh, settled, uh, their trades are being settled in yuan in Asia, and that's because their partners want yuan's and they don't want dollars. So um, 
I think already that this has begun. So it may have, it may be something that's already beginning, but it's just not being, you know, it's not on our radar screen and there's not, you know, not a lot of statistics out there uh, to, to point this out, you know, to take, show us what is happening. But I think it's very likely that, uh, uh, in many ways, uh, the United States is, has overstepped its bounds. Um, I mean, my God, we just, uh, our wars all over the world are being financed by printing dollars. And, um, you know, so the dollar is, is losing its value. So all the countries of the world, such as uh, China and Japan, who each hold a trillion dollars, uh, of our, Actually, they're holding trillion a trillion dollars of treasury bills that you know they would exchange for dollars. Um, they're becoming increasingly nervous that their holdings of American uh, financial instruments in dollar terms are depreciating as they sit there. So they don't like this. Uh, they don't really quite know what to do about it yet. Uh, or they, like I said before, they know that getting off of the dollar, ridding themselves of the dollar will not be pain free. And they're just at this point not willing to accept the consequences of it. But um, it will be done because, um, you know, as Herb Stein, Nixon's uh, financial advisor, uh, told him, you know, if something, can't continue, yeah, if something can't continue, it will not continue. And um, he was right. You know, something if, if American financial imperialism cannot continue, then it will not continue. It's just when will it happen? Well, Austrian economists, we know that uh, we don't like to answer any question that says when. Patrick, thanks so much for a fascinating and informative discussion. We will be back with more from Patrick next weekend in round two of our discussion of monetary imperialism. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend.